keep us on track. Here Should we go. I'll do a stopwatch. Oh, got it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this next session of AAC in the Cloud. We're really excited to be with you with one of our presenters who has been here since the beginning of AAC in the Cloud. So she's a, a fabulous voice about AAC, and we're, we're really thrilled for the things that she has to share. Um, this is Amanda Hartman and Shannon Braithwaite, and their presentation is AAC in Classrooms, Universal, multi Multimodal, and Engaging. And we'll turn things over to them. Thanks to both of you. We're glad to have you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda. Can to say hello, Shannon? Hi, I'm Shannon. Hi. <laughs> uh, and we're really glad to be here at AAC in the Cloud for 2023. Um, we do have our Slack channels open, so you can leave us a message there. We're seeing some of our friends um, in the Slack channel leaving us messages, so um, let us know where you're joining us from today. We're in Australia, of course. Um, it's early morning for us, but I do have a blanket on my knee because it's cold here, surprisingly, I know. Um, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started with our presentation. Um, we're really pleased to be here for AAC in the Cloud um, this year and to be talking about AAC in the Classroom. And um, yeah, to round out what's been a, uh, a, a really successful conf conference, I hope. Everybody's had lots of great sessions and learning. So we're closing the gate on the conference, it feels like, to a degree. We're the last, the last ones. So let me just move this out of the way so I can push play. So yes, um, we're talking about AAC in the classrooms today. And uh, my name's Amanda Hartman. I'm a speech pathologist. I have been a speech pathologist for, for many years. Um, I work for assistive wear, obviously, um, but I also work part-time. Um, I still work with clients. Um, so I still have families that come and visit who I support in their AAC journey. And I also, and that's how I met Shannon, I also do AAC consultancy in schools in, the, um, in Queensland, so where, where we live. Um, so Shannon and I started first met um, about over five years ago now, where I was able to work in her school, and we pretty we bonded right, Shan, <laughs> over our love for AAC and how we we're going to do it. So we've had lots of experience working in classes together, and uh, we really just wanted to share that with you today. Anything you want to add, Shannon? Um, no, just I'm Shannon. I'm a special ed teacher, so I still work in schools three days a week. Um, coaching teachers on how to support AAC users in their classroom. And then I work two days a week for assistive wear as well. Fantastic. Thanks, Shannon. So where are you? Who is in our audience today? If anybody's in the Slack channel and you want to let us know where you're at, uh, what your role is, and then we can find out because, you know, it's nice for us to know. We're a speech pathologist and a teacher team here. Um, we'd like to know where you're from. Um, we want to start this kind of conversation today about, I always picture the uh, people that come to AAC in the cloud, part of this AAC community as change makers. Um, I really think that, um, that we, this conference leads some really good change, you know, because we talk, talk about things and pioneer ideas. And so we really want to open, be open to that. So we've got some speech pathologists out there joining us today. So um, it'd be great to see speech pathologists being part of the changes that we can make to make the world better and more accessible for people that use AAC. And uh, obviously joining from all over the world. I wonder if there's any, are there any Aussies out there? Leave us a message if you're out there. Lots of um, friends in the in America. So we really want you to be open to change today and think that what we're talking about, it is big, bold thinking. Um, we, we talk about this wildfire idea that we want to spark a fire that is something that spreads through, um, not to burn things to the ground, but to excite and ignite people. Um, so we want to change the way that we think about things and change the way we do things. And we want to change the way that we talk about AAC to others um, and that we want to challenge the way that the way that we've always done AAC, just because we've done it a certain way doesn't mean that we should do it the same way forever in a day. Um, so our concepts for today for how AAC might be in the classroom, oh, it's great. We've got some teachers out there, Shan, that's nice, is that we really want AAC in a classroom to be something that's considered to be universal, um, something that you, leans into all the multimodal learning opportunities that already exist in classrooms and that, of course, at the cornerstone of all learning in a classroom um, has to come with engagement. 
So for us, what this means, we want AAC to be something that's universal. And when we say universal, we mean everyone. And when we say everyone, everyone, everyone can use it. Everyone can learn something from it because all abilities and disabilities can benefit from the use of AAC in the classroom. Um, now, we also think about AAC being part of a whole multimodal facet. It's a visual, uh, different forms of visual information, a variety of that. And that in classrooms, we can present information and content in different ways. And as I said at the beginning, um, we know that we have increased learning when there's increased engagement. So we're looking at AAC will be more effective if it's interactive and purposeful and meaningful. So with change, thinking about how we change doing things, um, I think we have to start with a change. Well, not I, but we think that we have to start with a change, even how we define AAC, that we don't just go back to our, we know what AAC stands for. It's a long, icky acronym that doesn't feel greatly easy to understand, but we're stuck with it because it's it's known and that's okay. But maybe we can change what we think it stands for. Um, the old definition that we've seen for many years, you know, Lean talks about the augmentative and alternative communication, about materials that supplement existing ver verbal abilities or communication methods that they use to replace verbal ability. And that's the old school definition. But our proposition is to say AAC actually is anything that's not speech. AAC is anything that's not speech. And so by that definition, that means that AAC is something that is universal and all, and it is something that we all use. As opposed to speech, speech is something that's only for some. So when we take this view of AAC, that we're all using AAC, different ways to communicate all of the time, that we're, then we can start thinking about how we can consider AAC as being a universal tool. So, and the way that we can start talking about AAC is a universal tool is by starting by the, with the facts that we know. These are just the facts. This is the stuff that we know um, that is, is not going to be in question. We can use AAC as a universal tool because we know that AAC will not stop speech development. Now, we're talking about where, you know, we're trying to make change in classrooms for people to do things in a different way. And to do that, to get to that point, um, it, it, we might have to challenge some thinking that AAC is going to make a kid lazy and it'll make them not speak or any of those things that we hear um, educators sometimes say. So we have to, we know, we know all the research, all of our best practice, all of our clinical information show that AAC does not stop or prevent the development of speech. And the other thing that we like to say is no one was ever killed by a symbol. I remember hearing Karen Erickson say this, and I always think of it. No one was ever harmed by the use of symbols, okay? And in fact, if you think about it, cavemen were using symbols since the beginning of time. They used symbols before they spoke words. And so as far as I know, there are no reported cases of death by symbols. Maybe a woolly mammoth got killed, but no people. So the last fact that we want to make sure that we all start with is that this AAC thing is not some fad. And, and Shannon and I have worked with lots and lots and lots of teachers to, to agree. They think that this is just a new thing and next, next year the speech pathologist or the team will come in with a new tricky thing that they have to learn. Um, you know, like it's, it, but we want to really say that where we are in the AAC community at the moment, when we're talking about a comprehensive, robust balanced, really great AAC, it's not a fad that's going away. And in fact, we're not ever going to keep, we're going to stay on this path of pushing for AAC in classrooms. It's not going to go out of fashion anymore. We're not going to make them change or pull the rug out from them and make them learn something new. We want them to get on board. So we want them to understand that AAC is not a fad that's about to go away because as for assisted where we talk about a social mission to make AAC an effective and accepted means of communication. And that's something that we want everyone in the AAC community to think about and having AAC as a universal tool is something that can allow for that. So, Shannon, what are we talking about? What kind of AAC are we talking about today? Thank you, Amanda. So we hear a lot about, like, comprehensive AAC systems, robust AAC systems, but let's have a chat about what that actually means. So what makes an AAC system comprehensive? So we know that a comprehensive AAC system, it's well-designed, it's got a large vocabulary with lots and lots and lots of words, to allow the AAC user to communicate for lots of different reasons. And we know that it needs to support the development of language. 
So all the speech pathologists who are watching, you probably already know this, but let's just go through it quickly. A robust AAC system, it needs core words. So they're the words that we use most frequently in our day-to-day -day conversations. So stop, go, more, finish. They're pronouns, prepositions, adjectives, verbs. We need fringe words, which are mostly nouns. So they're the people and places and things that we like to talk about. So words like Disneyland or chai latte. Um, we want to have the ability to add personal words and sentences and phrases. So I want to be able to talk about all of the friends in my class. So I want to add their names to the system. Um, I want to be able to add phrases that are important to me. So we have a young friend who loves the Wiggles song, hoop de doo and he will listen to this one line in the song that says, I'm a hoop de doo kind of guy. So let's um, make a button that says, I'm a hoop de doo kind of guy, so he can share that with people. We also want to make sure that the system has grammar and alphabet. So even if your student isn't yet using grammar supports or isn't yet typing on an alphabet, we want to make sure that that's available so that we can model that for them. So big ideas. Um, we talked about AAC being universal. So every classroom that I have ever been in, I've seen a large range of visual tools. They're already being used. So for morning circle, we see symbols with feelings and symbols for the weather. We see book boxes in the classroom so the kids know where to put their maths book and where to put their English book. We see symbols for different shapes in math centres and on and on and on. There's so many symbols already there. And when we talk about visual supports, we're referring to things like objects, photos, signs or pictures, any visual that's going to aid communication and learning. So here's the idea. What if we could just convince teachers that all of these visuals that they're already using every day in their classroom, they're already inside the AAC system? And in fact, the AAC system has more symbols than they're already using in the classroom. So they don't have to make any more. They're already in there. And the AAC system has organized them in a logical place that makes sense so that they can always find them. And it has to be better than this, right? This is a real photo of a real classroom. We didn't just like mess up all the symbols to take the photo. If I had to find these symbols to be able to use them in my lesson, that's going to be really, really hard. So surely having an AAC system where it's already organised for you, it's got to be easier. So also, what if everything these teachers have already done with visual tools, it can be done inside the AAC system? So that means no more printing and cutting and laminating and Velcro and trying to remember if the rough Velcro or the fuzzy Velcro, like which one goes on the back. I can never remember that. Um, if you lose the symbol, you have to remake it. Like all of this stuff is already in the AAC. And AAC can universally support the language and literacy development of all students in your class. So no longer are we having to make different symbols for different kids because we can just universally use this one tool and it's going to support everyone. So by using AAC, if you're a teacher out there, if you're a speech pathologist who works with teachers, if you know a teacher, we're going to save you time, we're going to save you effort because you're no longer having to make all of these symbols and it's going to be more organised and easier for you to use. So I think teachers can get on board with this. So our three main ideas, our main points that we're going to talk about in this session is communication versus compliance and what's the difference between those two things, multimodal and visual tools in classrooms, and then this idea of universal AAC for all learners. So communication versus compliance. We've talked about uh, what AAC is and what are visual tools. But now we need to look at how we're using these tools to support communication. So many teachers are saying, I um, like I'm using a visual, so I'm supporting communication, right? Like I'm using this symbol, so I must be doing it. But we know in reality, this isn't always the case. Um, also, just a trigger warning, we are going to talk a little bit about compliance in this section, so just be aware of that. So let's compare visual tools and AAC. Um, AAC, we know it's comprehensive, it has lots of words, it gives you the option to communicate for lots of different reasons. Visual tools, they're objects, photos, signs, pictures. Both can have a place in the classroom and both can be used to support communication and learning. But we also just need to be aware that sometimes 
the way we're using these visual tools maybe isn't supporting communication. Sorry. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we're avoiding any visual tools that tell a student what to do, okay? The purpose of visuals is to support interaction and that like communication back and forth. And we're not going to get that interaction if kids are just following directions. So Amanda and I did a bit of brainstorming and we've come up with a checklist. So teachers have told us that they're confused. Sometimes they don't know if like this visual tool that I'm using, is it supporting communication and learning or is it just for behaviour support? And they've also told us that they don't always know if the way they're using the visual tool is for communication or if it's for compliance. So we've made a checklist that hopefully is going to clear some things up and explain the difference. So our first point on the checklist is we need to think about, is this visual tool that I'm using, does this allow me to focus on connection? So is it a tool that I can use to really get to know my students, their likes and dislikes? Um, can they use it to share their thoughts? Can they show me who they truly are? Or does the tool only focus on following directions? So if I'm using a tool like is in this photo here, if I've only got the words, um, what does it say? Like stop, pack up, line up. Really, the student can't share anything about themselves. They can only follow the directions that are on that tool. Um, the next one's about success criteria. So I'm a teacher. We need a success criteria. Um, how do I know that this activity, this lesson, this AAC tool was successful? So is it just that the task was completed and I can tick it off and it's done? Like regardless of what it looked like or how we got there, it's just that I finished the task. Or is the more important part what actually happened during the activity? So the student got to participate, they shared their own thoughts, they interacted with others. Maybe the task got completed, maybe it didn't, but I know that the student had the opportunity to communicate and the opportunity to participate. Um, for the next one, who decides on the communication response? So have we as communication partners already decided what that child should say or do we want to share their own thoughts? And often when I go into classrooms, I see these choice cards. So when kids have finished their work, they get to choose, like, what's the activity that I get to do now? And I always wonder if you just put out four choice cards for that kid, do they really want to do any of those things or are they just, like, choosing the least bad option? So. Choice cards are not always bad, but let's also give them the AAC tool so they can say, not that, I want to do something different and we can hear their own response. Um, the next one, can the activity go in a different direction based on the AAC user's ideas or is there a predetermined set of steps or a right or wrong answer? I was teaching a class a little while ago now and we were reading a story called Who Sank the Boat? It's a beautiful Australian story. Little animals, they all jump in the boat and it's got this repeated line, who sank the boat? And one of the students on his AAC went, Peppa Pig. And I immediately went, Peppa Pig? Right? Peppa Pig's not in the story. We're learning about characters in the story. And I kept reading and he went, Santa. And he laughed. I went, okay, you're making a joke. I get it now. So at that point as a teacher, we can go, well, am I going to tell that kid, no, we're only talking about the characters in the story, we're only going to use the characters that are on your choice board, or are we going to lean in to what's really exciting and motivating for this kid and he's telling jokes? And maybe the activity is going to go in a bit of a different way, but you're going to have a better response. So I started writing. All the kids jumped in. They're all shouting out who should be sinking the boat. So I've made this big list on the board. And we ended up writing our own book about who sank the boat. And it had like Santa and Peppa Pig and one of the kids from Paw Patrol and all different things. But that ended up being such a motivating activity. And that book sat in our library for the rest of the year. The kids absolutely loved it. So don't be worried about your plans changing or really leaning into what those kids are interested in. Because at the end of the day, they still learn about characters in a story and it was more motivating and engaging for those kids. The next one is, is that visual tool available at any time whenever the kid wants to use it or is it only available for a specific purpose? So can I only talk about feelings during morning circle when I have my feelings cards out or 
can I only talk about what zone I'm in when someone asks me on the zones of regulation board? Or alternatively, is that language available all the time? So I can talk about feelings when I'm actually feeling those feelings. Or I can start to model and I can say, oh, like your friend looks sad. What can we do to help? The next point is, can the student tell you something or is the student only told what to do? And I think we've all seen these, uh, these lanyards that teachers wear. We wear them around our necks. We kind of wear them attached to our pants that has sets of instructions to tell the kids what to do. Um, is there an, any opportunity for the child to take that symbol and tell you to line up or tell you to stop? Unlikely. And also, is it a tool that's used to help the child talk about and process what's happening? Or is it just something that's used to control or direct or instruct what the child should do? I'm going to talk about that a little more in the next slide. So lots and lots of classrooms that I go into, they have these um, visual schedules, which are really nice. So it helps to um, show the child what's going to happen during their day. It's nice and predictable. And if we put a core board or we put the AAC next to that, the child can talk about what's happening in their day. So they could say, um, you know, I like shared reading. When's lunch happening? Or not maths. I don't like that. I use a diary to write down kind of what I do through my day um, and it helps me to kind of stay focused and know what I need to do. So these things are really helpful. I guess less helpful are uh, ways that I've seen like first then charts used in classrooms traditionally. Um, often they're just used to kind of give directions of what the child should do. So first we're going to go to the bathroom and then we're going to get some candy or First, I need to finish my maths and then I'm going to get some iPad time. First then charts don't always have to be bad. They don't always have to be kind of bossing kids around. I've seen them used really nicely as well. So they can just be used as a reminder of like steps to follow in a routine. So we could have one up in the bathroom that says, first we go to the bathroom, then we wash our hands. We're not forcing a child to wash their hands. We're definitely going to encourage it. Um, but it's just there as a reminder. I also really like to use first then to help kids to make a plan and plan what they're going to do through their day. Um, so in this example, the child chose like first we're going to sing the hello song and then we're going to read a story and then we're going to do some investigations. So obviously children can't always plan everything that's going to happen during their school day. We know that you have a routine you need to follow. But think about can they plan what they're going to do at playtime or can they plan part of their school day? Um, I was in a classroom earlier this year, actually, and the class had made, you know, one of those paper mache volcanoes that you pour the stuff in and it explodes. And the kids were so excited, like they wanted to share this story with everyone. But inevitably what happens next is people go, oh, how did you make it? That's a whole lot of steps for a young person to remember. So we used first, next, then to really come up with a sequence and the steps of what happened. So first we got the paper mache and we made it. And next we painted it and then last it erupted. And then we saved that onto a button for the students so that they were able to go around and share their story with lots of different people. Bossy lanyards and bossy symbols. So I think these are in every school that you go to, you will see teachers wearing these things around their neck. And they're usually used just to give instructions to children. So they're often things like you need to go to the toilet, you need to line up, you need to sit on the floor, stop. Um, there's no real opportunity for these kids to use these things to communicate. They're really just used for you to give directions to the kids. But a nice alternative for this is a power word lanyard. So um, this is Jack. And Jack is a young man who likes to know what's happening during his day. He finds it... Um, he can get quite anxious if he doesn't know what's coming next. So he'll spend a lot of time asking, like, what's happening today? What's happening today? So that's a phrase he needs to have access to really quickly. So this is his power words lanyard, and that's the first one on there. So he can go up to anyone who's around him and he can ask what's happening today. So we're not going to have it instead of an AAC system. It's going to be something that supplements that. And obviously, this isn't used for people to boss him around. These are things that he wants to say. 
And next up, Amanda with Multimodal Tools and Visuals to Support AAC. Thank you. Um, thanks, Shannon. Well, now that we know the difference between the types of tools and visuals and, um, you know, communication tools for connection or compliance, and we're a bit on the same page, let's lean into some of those visual tools and all the different multimodal things that already organically live in classrooms and how we might pair those with AAC. So this is this next bit. Yeah, um, just in the Slack channel, people are enjoying that we called them bossy lanyards. That's so true. And that we could, instead of having bossy lanyards, have the power words, you know, those really quick, important phrases kids want to say. So thanks for always put your comments in the Slack. We can respond to them. So let's think. Uh, so this next part where I'm, I'm just going to be dumping a whole lot of photos to you of different examples that um, Shannon and I've collected over the years of, of different ways that um, multimodal uh, tools can mean. So basically the big things that we're talking about are all the different ways we communicate that includes pictures, pictures in books, photographs, um, even emoji, all of those sorts of things. So that's that's kind of what we're talking about. And I guess the question is, is does would AAC replace all of these visuals? I mean, there are some visuals we want to replace, bossy lanyards, I'm looking at you, but, you know, in, in, the, in a lot of contexts, uh, there is still a place for all these visuals. Um, so I would say, like, are we going to get rid of all of these just so that we have AAC? And of course, our answer is no, we're not going to replace all of these, because I think that there's a way that we can enhance interactions with the AAC and visuals. They can really go nicely pair to pair, pair and pair together. So, um, and just a point to note that, of course, sign language and gesture is something that's been used uh, for people with communication difficulties for a long time. And it's another visual modality. So it also, it's also can be useful and, and enhance meeting. So I guess, I guess the, the message is that all these different forms of communication still all play a part in the classroom. Um, yeah, and there's just a comment uh, from Phoenix in the Slack channel that about our presentation is thinking about those Montessori classrooms and how visual supports are and aren't used in those spaces. Yeah, so that's that. And, that, and that's kind of what we're trying to do, that universality of, of what tools we can use. So, you know, things, books, we have picture books. Books, books are core business in classrooms. We don't need every single word from every single book noun. I'm looking at the nouns, the noun towns. We don't need that programmed into our AAC. We can use the AAC and then we can point to the pictures in the book so that we're doing those things side by side. Um, every book area should have a core word board next to it so that we can be talking about the books and using having lots of opportunity to model and see that language. It's the same in math. So like teachers are already using number boards and um, tens charts and whatever math things that a speech pathologist shouldn't talk about, sorry. Um, but, you know, that those are visuals that are, that are already being used in classrooms. Well, how does it look if we put a core word board it? Oh, we're going to do some more math. Oh, I need some help with this. Yes, that's the right answer. So we can model more language when we put the AAC side by side. We don't, I mean, of course we have numbers in our AAC, but we can also use the tools that already exist in classrooms and do these as an add-on. Um, same with word walls in Australia. We have word walls everywhere. So, um, you know, it's really good if we can put the core word boards next to those and be able to see how we can do sentence building with those interesting words that we've been learning about and thinking about within our language paired with a bit more language with our AAC. And same, calendar charts, you're going to go into classrooms where they've got visuals with the schedules. And Shannon talked about this before, having the calendar, having the visuals alongside. So you're not just going, it's English, it's English. You can be, you know, it's time for next, we're going to do this. And oh, when, when are we doing stories? I like I like music time. So it's just important to have those things side by side. And you can see just a few different setups that we've seen there. And also think, you know, like setting up a play space that just screams to you, we we use and believe that AAC is for all of our students. Play zones are set up so that the AAC is just there and ready to go. Um, and you, you know that like the, the language that are on these boards is generic play-based language. They've got all the real objects there to choose from, but they've got all those extra words that they might need to be able to increase their participation and interaction with their peers in, um, in these sorts of activities. Um, 
lots of classes, of course, that we're going into have phonics charts and and posters. So what if we had some AAC? So so we had um, uh, one of our schools, Shannon, made these up where, you know, we had for every letter, we had a core word board with a whole lot of words that start with that letter so that it, and the kids would stand there and point to the pictures and try and say the words and think about the sounds they made. It just created another opportunity um, to not just talk about a fish, but to talk about Facebook and a frog and French fries and all the other words that start with F and it helped uh, generate more language. Um, I also am a firm believer in teaching kids how to use emoji to communicate. Very important visual emojis and gifts, actually. Um, you know, so if there's a space in a classroom where, you know, you can talk about emojis and what they mean. Um, this young man, we uh, we we spent a whole we spent <laughs> we spent a whole session thinking about what emo emojis mean and uh, what the face is actually saying. Um, we recently we updated this, and he's now got the the shrug shoulder which stands for him, meh, like M-E-H, and that's become his favourite word. When mum says, why don't you want to do such and such, he just goes meh and shrugs her. I don't think mum likes that response so much, but, you know, that's real communication, isn't it? So, um, you know, thinking about the meaning that's in emoji that's so universal, that's another. That's a universal <laughs> uh, AAC right there is emoji. Um, we also want to use AAC for real purposes in classrooms. So um, sending messages, sending emails, that's another form of communication. And so using our AAC to generate messages and text message them to mom or send emails to mom is just really useful. So most AACs will have a way to, to either copy and paste or to share from within the app um, the, the messages. And so think about a mom at home um, who gets a message that says, we went to the live and I got a book about dinosaurs that already sets the scene for a great conversation um, when uh, their child gets home uh, that afternoon and similarly um, we looked at photos of waterfalls today can we go getting an email mum and dad getting an email about that isn't that going to be a really nice and effective way to to use your AAC and then communicate in further ways um, we use talk about using split screen a lot of the technology allows us to do so these days. So having your AAC on one side and having whatever on the other side, we've got a few examples and YouTube is a classic example. YouTube is like genuine communication in classrooms. And, and you know, like, I don't know how many times if you've seen students and they like scrub to one particular part of a movie to, to replay a line or a part of a story that they really are excited about, that's communication. They're sharing something with you that they really, really like. Um, and by putting it on split screen, so you've got the, the video, the YouTube channel video playing on one side, and then you can be talking about it with the A's and the other side. It's just such a really nice uh, interaction to have. Um, and and then photos, like photos, let's use and take photos because the beginning of so many conversations. And um, one of my schools do these, you know, those big empty hallways that we walk down in, in classrooms. Um, a few of my schools are just decorating them with photos and putting call word boards up there and stopping with kids. Kids love looking at photos of themselves and having these photo walls in hallways. Um, it's actually, you know, it's just stopping kids from going to class on time. Sorry about that. I've got to stop and have a conversation with my friends about these nice photos. That's no worries to me. <laughs> okay. So, you know, it's really important that we sh you take photos of the things that we're doing um, and and um, so I was just reading a comment in the Slack channel. One of uh, um, the people in the Slack channel knows a quote from the duck song in the last slide. That's awesome. <laughs> That's exactly what we need. <laughs> what do we mean? That's uh, fantastic. Um, okay, so what else can we do? You know, we can put we can put symbols with writing and in displays, use symbol supports, um, you know, for, to demonstrate the writing or for documenting and sharing, using photos um, about what's happened for the week. And um, it's just photos are so useful, obviously. Another thing I love to do is making photo books. Um, I've used Pictello in this, but there's a few. You know, you can like hover your AAC over there. So whilst you're looking at your book that you've made, you can be talking about it using your AAC. 
And same with your camera roll, put the split screen, your AAC on one side and your photos on the other. And it just is a really nice way to have conversations about photos. And let's face it, kids love looking at photos or maybe they've made a book. Got a young man who particularly likes Doctor Who. So he's got a whole book that he's made in Keynote um, or PowerPoint put it on one side, the AAC on the other. So, you know, it's really important that we can do some of these things. Um, so there is a, a question in the Slack channel that I'll just specifically answer because it is, it is important to address. So <clears throat> Rose has asked as whether we have any thoughts on prioritising which visuals to use in classrooms with children um, that have CVI, where reduced visual clutter is necessary. And that is really important that we do talk about because, yes, there are some children with cortical visual impairment or visual processing that might, the clutter could be a difficult thing. Um, I guess our main go-to for any of those is making sure that we have lots of uh, black backgrounds to house the, the visuals and yeah, that, that there's ways to cover or put away some so that you can reduce the visual clutter at some times. Um, but we have like big, like black Velcro boards. I've got one here, like a, 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 a Velcro board, um, you know, where you might, that still looks visually busy, but you know, you could organize that a little bit better for the symbols. And I think it would be looking, working with your team to see what their visual cap capacity was so that you made sure that you had the right visual setup for them, for their vision skills. Shannon, anything you would want to add to answer that question? Yeah, I think um, teachers in classrooms get really good at balancing those things. And I think it is a balancing act, making sure that the visual tools are available for all of the students in your class, but also taking into account that one student that might need a different AAC tool or might need things put away at different times or different colours, like Amanda said. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah, if you have a student in a classroom that has a CVI or needs those supports, just getting your team together and really having those conversations about what's going to work best for that student. And I think um, our concept of having AAC is a universal design as a universal tool for learning doesn't mean that we've completely forgotten about kids with complex bodies that can't see or touch you know AAC you know that ha you know that requires fine touch um it just means that uh of course we need to make sure as a team we're looking specifically at those people's uh, those students needs um uh but it doesn't mean that the universal tool is not something that can benefit all of the students in the classroom. But of course, we need to problem solve more for someone who might need alternate alternative. There's still, there's still the need for that. Um, the last thing I just want to talk about with all this multimodal is one of the things that we see in classrooms a lot is kind of vocabulary cards or what could be called an activity board or words that are specific for a lesson. Um, so we see some of these used in Australian schools. I don't know if you see them in the US where they've got really specific vocabulary, artificial, natural, light, and they're really just used for a particular, like a science lesson talking about, um, you know, light and darkness and stuff. And we just want to make sure that if we're using tools like that, just to say we need to use them with caution because there's not enough language in that for kids to be able to learn more, or explain what they know. Um, so we want to make sure that we have enough language. So if a teacher is using some vocabulary specific cards, can they pair it alongside um, a core word board so there's more language to be able to talk about what those things mean um, <clears throat> and generate more language and conversation about it? And of course, um, you know, activity boards do have a place, you know, in messy play or when you're outside and the iPad screen doesn't work so well. So it's not that it's like an all or nothing. You should never use a board with just activity vocabulary. There are places and times when they work okay. Basically, the big picture, the Shannon and I, we want it all. We want the core word boards and the AAC. We want rhyming word flashcards, the pictures in the book, real objects, yes, no cards. We want... Um, yeah, we want all the all the things, um, special, perhaps special vocabulary for the book. So um, I think that's kind of we were just trying to give you some ideas on all the different visuals and multimodal tools that are available um, and that can really work in classrooms that we've seen happen. 
And I'm going to pass over to Shannon, who's going to share some stories with us now. Thank you. I am. Um, so this section is about how we can have AAC for all of the learners in our class. So uh, we've got a bit of a Stranger Things reference there in front of the, the alphabet wall. Um, but we need to rethink in our classes who can benefit from AAC. Let's make AAC universal. We know it can benefit everybody. So we're going to share some stories um, about some real students. Some of the names have been changed just for privacy reasons, but they are real stories. So the first one, this is Dominic. Um, Dominic is an autistic student and he has speech, but he tells us that sometimes his speech doesn't work as well when he's having big feelings or he's feeling sensory overloaded or he's dysregulated. So he tells us that sometimes it's easier to type or to use symbols than it is to talk because when I use symbols or when I type, it takes that pressure off to speak. Um, and I really think having conversations with some adult AAC users, so many have told us that They've gotten AAC as adults. They've gotten AAC in college or when they finish school, they've found it themselves. So really, I guess, have a think about who in your schools currently could be a Dominic, who could be benefiting from AAC. They just doesn't, don't know it exists yet. Um, our next student is Dylan. And so Amanda talked before about photos and Dylan is like the king of photos. So if he wants to have a conversation with you, the first thing he will do is he will bring up his device and he will scroll through his camera roll and he'll show you a photo. And that's great because it sets the context. So I'll go, oh, you're, you want to tell me something about your birthday party? I already know what it is he wants to talk about. And then he'll back up his idea using details on his AAC. Um, it's really cool. He's now learned to take photos himself and he will email them. He'll text them to people. And when he can't find a photo for what he wants to talk about, he started to search into Google Images. He's also started making his own photo books in Pictello, which is really, really cool. So it's a really nice way to communicate using something that's clearly an interest of his, um, but really helps with communication. Our next student is Ethan. So Ethan is a young man with cerebral palsy and he uses pod with partner assisted scanning. And Ethan loves to be part of whole class discussions. But previously, that's, what was happen... Ethan's teacher? That's Ethan's teacher, that's not teacher. Ethan. Sorry, that's his teacher. Um, so previously, what would happen was like a teacher aide would sit with Ethan and she would scan for him and she would find out what he wanted to say. But like conversations move so fast. By the time Ethan got his thoughts out, like the conversation had moved on. So this poor teacher aide is trying to butt in to say what Ethan's thoughts were, but it really, it wasn't happening in real time. So this wonderful teacher, um, she's now taken on the role of scanning for Ethan during whole class discussions. And it's slower. And the kids in the class have all had like many, many conversations around wait time, but it's been amazing because now Ethan can participate in real time. And the kids have really started to see him as someone who has valuable contributions to discussions. It's also had the added bonus that there's some other students in that class who maybe needed a little bit more time to really think of the idea and get those thoughts out. So by having that longer wait time, it's really helped them as well. Um, our next student is Chloe. So Chloe is a speaking student and she uses AAC maybe differently to um, how most people use it, but she uses AAC as a dictionary and a thesaurus. So Chloe has limited vocabulary um, and she has some language delays. So by using AAC, it's really helped her to um, construct longer sentences, construct more grammatically correct sentences. She started to spell words by using the AAC. Um, and this is purely just by having it available in her classroom. Our next student's Bonnie. And Bonnie is a student who has English as a second language. So anyone who has ever tried to learn a second language knows like just how frustrating it is when you know what you want to say, but you can't think of the word in that language. I tried to learn Spanish a few years ago, like it was a disaster, Could, couldn't do it. Um, but Bonnie's really good at recognising symbols. So she's learnt now that she can find the symbol for the word that she wants and then she can tap it and then she can listen to the word in English. So this has really helped her to 
like participate in lessons. It's helped her with vocabulary and sentences. Um, and it's also really helped her to spend more time in that like just general education classroom. So she's with her friends. She's less time being spent being withdrawn by a support teacher to really do those English lessons. She's able to do that within her regular classroom with her friends. And this is Jack and Sam. I absolutely love this photo. The little friendship between these two is just the most beautiful thing. Um, no one comes to school and just wants to talk to the teacher. Like, we're not fun. Everyone deserves to be able to communicate with their friends to anyone they want to communicate with. And this is really what's happened um, between Jack and Sam. So Jack is not an AAC user, but he uses it as well as any teacher that I've seen because he wants to know what his friend thinks. He wants to talk about Pokemon and talk about all the things that are really exciting to him. And that's helping Sam with his um, learning of AAC as well. So it's really lovely to see these friendships develop through AAC. And early years classrooms, preschools, kindies, I could walk into any playground and I've got my AAC on me and I'm just going to be swarmed by kids. I'm not going to know who speaks and who doesn't and who speaks sometimes. I'm just going to start using my AAC and I'm just going to start having conversations. And I think this works really well in those early years classrooms because all the kids have a mix of abilities. We don't know what at this stage, who was going to speak and who's going to need AAC. We're just going to use it with everybody. Um, so it really helps these kids participate, not just in their classes, but in social interactions as well. Amanda. Okay, so we've shared some really nice practical ideas of things that we've seen work. We've shared some stories, but um, we're not oblivious to the idea that there are big barriers to making big change. And uh, we see that. We see that in our in our day to day. And I think the biggest thing is that we acknowledge that AAC is actually hard. Um, and more than that, AAC as a universal tool is just too different to what has been done before. Um, and people might pick it up and not feel that it's intuitive that they can pick it up and use, just use it straight away. And then when people are easily overwhelmed that it's too hard or too much, it become, it gets put in the too hard basket and it isn't done. So this is a reality that we need to um, overcome. We don't always have the solutions to it other than what well, we're going to talk about a couple of things that we've uh, that have helped us make this happen. Um, so we can talk about that in a minute. But it's also really important to remember that AAC is not traditionally a part of the way that they always worked. So it's hard to establish and then maintain. And so that's where we have to we we have to start. And then that that whole it's, you know, not only am I too busy, but I'm too busy with my daily things to learn something new that's hard and it's different to what I've ever done before. So we just want to, I think the biggest thing about barriers is accepting that those are barriers and then problem solving within your schools about how you can overcome these things. Um, and then the last biggest barrier that we see is that teachers don't yet see the value of AAC. They don't yet see the positive impact that it could have on all of the students. Um, they're just still worry, you know, worrying about that, <laughs> how hard it is to make it happen and use it consistent and flexibly across, flexibly across a day. So what, what are some of the things that we have done to make it happen? A short list, because we are rounding out our time. Um, these are just some starting points and ideas. It is really good if you wanted to trial using AAC with everyone in a class to really try and pick the right teacher and the right classroom. Um, that, you know, someone that you know is motivated, is going to stick at it and that you're going to see the best results because success breeds success. If you get some good success stories behind you, then it helps grow. Um, Shannon and I are firm believers that we go into a classroom and model alongside teachers and you do it with all students. You don't just go, oh, I'm going to go in and I'm just going to model with this non-speaking child that's sitting over here. Like I just go in and I sit next to who, to whoever and I model with all the students. I let them all have a go at AAC and that's really important. It's really great to get alongside teachers and understand what their lessons are and think about how you could, um, what language you could model and do that alongside the teachers. 
collect video examples of everything, you know, uh, good, bad and, and everything so that you've got examples of how AAC can work because people like watching those videos of things in action so that they can put things into place and it makes it real and, and believable for them. Um, it's really important to find the bright, bright spots. So really, rather than that focus on the barriers and the stuff that's not working, shine the light on the things that are great, even if they're just little things. And not only just find them, share them, talk about them, celebrate them. This is all part of what makes change. And I talk a lot about that AAC wildfire, that success catching on, success breeds success. The more positive examples and stories and videos that we share that show how any learner made a difference with AAC, um, that really Teachers talking to teachers about that stuff really can make an impact and change. And we talk a lot about an AAC culture and we can see that there's cultural or systemic change across the school when we see that there's more teachers doing it than not. And that to me is always a really nice thing. And we also know that um, AAC as a universal tool in classrooms will not really happen if it's not supported at a leadership policy school-wide level. It has to have that support and backing that will definitely um, help. So those are still challenges and <laughs> starting points and there's a lot to unpack there. But um, to the point of today was really just to inspire you and to make you realise that there's lots of benefits and outcomes to, to things. Right, Shan? Absolutely. So like we know that AAC can be hard, but we can do hard things. So if we can just work out a way to overcome these barriers, the benefits to our students are going to be huge. So some of these benefits, um, we're going to see improved peer connections and friendships. So we talked about Sam and Jack and their amazing connection that they have. They're the best of friends. We're going to see that for more of our students in our school. We're going to see more inclusion. So Dominic included in his mainstream classroom with all of his peers. We're going to see increased language and literacy for all of our students, not just that student that's non-speaking, but all of the students that are in that classroom. We're also going to see increased engagement and participation. But that's one of our big things we've been talking about today. Let's make it engaging for these kids. Let's encourage all of our students to participate. So here our war cry, this is what we're here for. We want AAC for everybody. We want AAC everywhere. We want, oh, here it is, the fancy slide. We want it to be universal, Sorry. multimodal, <clears throat> and of course, engaging. So um, I'm Shannon, that was Amanda. We've really loved presenting to you today. We hope that you've got something that you can take away and you can take back to your schools and start implementing in classrooms. On the next slide, we have our, this is our website. So we're from Assistive Wear. Um, lots of information on there that might be able to help and support you. And this is our email for our support team, which you're welcome to email anytime. Um, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. We do. Yes. Yeah, so somebody just asked um, me to just repeat what I said about activity boards. So I'm going to go back to that, but then there are um, some other questions coming in. So um, basically the point that I made about activity boards is um, I think that's okay in certain instances to have activity boards, but I, I don't, I'm not a fan of an activity board that just has the answers to the question. That's a bit of a, these are the forced responses. You're going to talk about the light, the sun, the artificial dark shadows, uh, you know, you're going to talk about that and nothing else. So we want to really have um, activity specific with core word boards or that full AAC there so that we can have a bigger, deeper conversation about it. And of course, activity boards do work in situations where it's messy play or it's outside. So I think that that's just the, um, the main thing that I wanted to say to go back. So I hope that answered that person's question. Um, there's not, there is a place activity specific boards quite often get good buy-in, they're good starting points, but the limitations are often they don't have enough language on them. So as long as we have lots of language and we use them alongside our full AAC, then we're good to go. Um, but I'm going to stop sharing because there is a question in um, the Slack channel that I'm going to go back to. So Jennifer asked, would you ideally have an AAC device for every student or share devices? Um, I don't know what schools you're in, but the idea that every student has an AAC. Be amazing. <laughs> wow. But no, we don't. We usually have shared devices, but we do do things like being able to mirror the iPad screen up onto whiteboards. And we always have 
the paper backups on things so that you could you might use a paper based one versus the AAC. But ideally, yeah, I mean, if we can get to a situation where everyone has the AAC in their hot hands, then that's great. But typically, we would see classrooms like two, three iPads, maybe Shannon and the schools that we work in. But um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think that that's the reality of what we're dealing with. Rose just made a comment. Universal AAC also helps more adults and kids to recognize AAC when they use someone using it and know what it is. You're right. We're really, and that's part of that whole idea, making it an accepted form and something that everybody knows and understands to use. So um, yeah, so we do uh, that. We're yeah, we're going to wrap up. Um, but uh, please, if there's any more, thank you very much for the kind comments and for coming along. I hope you'll all have very full brains from a couple of days of learning with the team at AAC Cloud and the great lineup. But um, that's great. And anyway, as, as I said, our thing is just about making change. We believe that the AAC community that come to AAC in the clouds are part of the change makers in the industry, like in the field of AAC, and that we can really do great things. So, all right. So good. We good. Awesome. Shannon and Amanda, thank you so much. What a what a great presentation. I love these hands-on experiences, in-depth, very, very kind of personal or applicable options to be able to share. So thank you both for, for your time and for giving time to these students to, to develop these ideas and understanding so that you can come and share. This was a really great presentation and we appreciate it. Thank you both for being here. We, we sincerely appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's attended this session and any of the other sessions of AAC in the Cloud. And if you missed any sessions, which you probably did because there's a ton of them, go back and watch yeah. them. Amanda, you were gonna say something. Oh, um, we do, our slides are available. Do we put them in the Slack? Sure, channel you can or... put them in there and then I'll also link them to your session um, on our conference website so people can find them there too. Okay, so cool. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you everyone and we will see you next year. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks, bye. bye.